You are listening to the first episode of No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday edition of the Professional Left Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts and at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at the Professional Left Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. Yeah, let's get that straight right up. It's not safe for work. Uh, We'll be back on a regular schedule next week, but this week we have a conflict So we decided to launch this inaugural episode of NFRS early for you to listen to and tell us what you think. So why do we need a second podcast, Drift Glass? Well, Blue Gal, it's actually a third podcast. If you count our (laughs) orphaned podcast, the Science Fiction University, which actually isn't orphaned at all. It's just a little less frequent. Uh, The idea behind this new podcast is to do what almost no other political or media podcasts do but which movie and TV and literature podcasts do all the time, which is look back at that which came before and give it some context. For example, a movie like Boogie Nights, which has been recently reviewed on a podcast I listen to all the time, did not spring fully formed as a finished product from the mind of Paul Thomas Anderson. It came into being as the result of his genius and his teenage obsession with porn, plus the influence of all the directors he admired, plus the willingness of a studio boss to greenlight his project, plus this traumatic experience he had with his first movie, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A whole bunch of things had to happen for it to occur. It also had a profound influence on everything that came after it, and that's our point. Uh, I, I know it seems absurdly obvious and reductive to say that cultural events exist within a cultural context and a continuum, And yet, within the fields of media and politics, virtually all the very serious voices that dominate those conversations are almost always pathologically focused on decontextualizing landmark events. And Drift Glass, I think it's okay to give credit to the rewatchables, because that's the podcast that you were listening to. I think you're wrong, because never mention other podcasts, Blue Gal. (laughs) Never mention them in my presence. Don't talk about it in my presence. Yeah, it's no. the rewatchables. It's it's, it's a wonderful. It's the rewatchables. Yeah. It's it's Bill Simmons' birthday, and for his birthday present for the six hundred or eight hundred or three hundredth episode, they did a two part retrospective on their collective favorite movie, Boogie Nights, which is an amazing movie and a, a breakthrough mm-hmm. movie for Paul Thomas Anderson. But it, there is no literature professor, for example, who ever said, "Well, Raymond Carver's here, so let's never talk about Hemingway or Chekhov again," because they're dead. And there's no film critic who's ever said, you know, burn your John Ford box sets because Western genre filmmaking began and end with Sergio Leone or maybe Akira Kurosawa or maybe Quentin Tarantino, because that wouldn't just announce to the world that you're a moron. It would get you laughed out of the peer group that you're in, the professional academy that you're a part of. And yet there is no subject more aggressively avoided by the very serious men and women who dominate the media and politics than the past, specifically the Republican Party's past, how it came to be the racist shit pile it is now, and how the media enabled it by coddling the GOP when it was in power and memory holding its atrocities when it was out of power. Yep. Yup. Now, you and I have been writing about politics and the media since the earliest days of the liberal blogosphere, the dim and distant past, and you and I as we both readily admit, have been politics and media nerds since long before it became possible to hit publish and share our thoughts with the world. And since almost the very beginning, no fair remembering stuff and memory is the liberal superpower have been the spirit of our collective enterprises since the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So today, we're going to tell you a story about a thing the right does extremely well and at which the left sucks. And that is player development. Are you ready for a story, Blue Gal? I am ready for a story, Dirk Glass. All right. Okay, put, tuck your shawl around your shoulders and curl up by the fire. <laughs> Have all 92 cats come around you and purr and, be, and let you be warm and sip your cardamom tea, which I know you're sipping right now. And 
Let's start by defining player development. And to do that, I'm going to borrow some text from a job posting, believe it or not, for player development and team services coordinator for the Chicago Bulls. Okay? So mm -hmm. it's going to rock. This is the best writing you'll, you'll listen to all week. <laughs> it's a job description for a gig with the Bulls. As coordinator, you will report directly to the senior manager of player development and team services and serve as a resource of support for the player's professional, personal, and social development. You will have hands-on involvement with our players and basketball operations staff and will be responsible for the following. Develop strong, trusting relationships with players, their families, and close friends. Assist with planning, coordinating, and executing of off-the-court player development initiatives and programming, i.e. finance, money management, career transitioning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what player developers do. They're responsible for taking the raw talent, the people that they, they, they scout out in the field, out there in the world, and introducing them to the world of professional sports, hand, helping them handle their finances, handling the media, learn how not to make a fool of yourself on camera, and so on and so forth. It's a really essential part of sort of professionalizing someone who's coming up through the ranks. So Drift Glass had occasion to review a post from September of 2009. It's really one of his more famous posts. It's called Like a Virgin. And it's about how 9-11 was a catalyzing event that finally drove the right all the way off the cliff from which they had been dangling for decades. Mm -hmm. Uh and it had a huge spike in reviewership just after the 2016 election, because yeah. I guess it was linked a place <laughs> or two. Yeah. Uh, people remembered it. And so uh, you reviewed that post. And what did you what did you come up with or what what looking at well, it now all these years later? All these many years later, I was looking through these posts. I was I was going to throw it at Keith Olbermann because Keith Olbermann came up with this theory like last mm -hmm. week, speaking of podcasts that we don't speak of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that 9-11 was what finally drove the right completely crazy. They were crazy for a long time, and this has broke them. And since then, it's been crazy. And I said, Keith, my old friend, um, I'm slightly taller than you. And I'm telling you now, you need to go back way before your theory that came into existence a week ago and read my post from 2009, which I'm sure he's not going to do. Uh, but when I reviewed the post, the name from the past that clearly illustrates how efficiently the right is player development and how they're constantly building their bench and feeding new faces and voices into the propaganda machine popped right out. And it was a woman named Katie Abrams. Oh, my goodness. Katie, Katie Abrams. Abrams. Katie Abrams, a voice from the past. The voice and, saying, I don't want the United States to turn into Russia. To Soviet Russia. Over health care. <laughs> right. Over health care. Over providing people with health care. <laughs> now, as far as our story today begins... Her story, and I'm getting all this off of public websites. I'm not stealing any information or, or, or giving addresses or doxing her in any way. This is all publicly available information. Her story begins in 1999 as an enterprise rent-a-car manager trainee. Okay. okay. And then it's she worked job. for... Mm -hmm. It's a job. It's a perfectly fine job. Nothing against that job. And she worked later as an auto claims adjuster for Encompass Insurance for a couple of years. Okay. So... Okay. Pretty typical, working in the automotive field, you know, doing claims adjustments, et cetera. I worked for an insurance company back in my youth. Nothing weird about that. Then, according to her creation myth, which is bullshit, by the way, <laughs> in 2009, she was just an aw shucks, average patriotic citizen who spontaneously woke up to politics because Barack Obama, the Kenyan usurper, and his evil socialist Obamacare scheme threatened to destroy America. And she let the world know that because she went to a town hall meeting in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, with her Senator Arlen Specter and stood up and said, and I quote, she didn't want to live in Soviet Russia, and you have awakened the sleeping giant, sir. And what happened to her after that? She was immediately booked on the Sean Hannity show. She's a rock star. Because she spoke the, the, the untruth to power. <laughs> yes. now, and, and when she was immediately booked on the Sean Hannity show... Uh, she assured the viewers that, first of all, she had been a, a Clinton voter and regretted that deeply. And she said, I'm not bust in. I'm a normal person, which is not exactly true. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I poached a lot of this from your blog, Blue Gal. Right. Right. Um, after you. Yeah. She had uh, 
actually been an experienced Glenn Beck 912 organizer online. Mm -hmm. And she'd been in, interested in politics since at least 2006 when the Republicans lost control of Congress. So she's kind of making up a lot of bullshit about right. her spontaneously being a normal person. There's a famous, at least to us, interview uh, with her, with Lawrence O'Donnell from that period. That um, I did an annotated video of where yes, <laughs> I poked fun at her. You did. Quite a bit and her lack of intelligence mm -hmm. uh, until she said, well, I think we've always been at war. I don't pay any attention to our invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan. That turned it into 1984. That turned it into Orwell because yeah. she trusted the government to do everything, including fight wars for her. Mm hmm. Uh, as long as it was George W. Bush in charge, as long right. as it was a white man running the show. And oh. she got uh, indoctrinated by Glenn Beck mm -hmm. into thinking, oh, something's terribly wrong with America because Barack Obama was elected president. Right. That that broke her. That brain. was that was what broke her. Yeah. And and Lord Zadell really did ask. I think he was being too um, cute by half, but he was like, yeah. You really didn't notice politics, the Iraq war, Katrina, the 9-11, none of that sort of crossed your mind at all. And she's like, nope, nope. I just, you know. No, I didn't really. I'm sorry, but I'm not, maybe I'm not that smart, but I didn't really care. And it mm -hmm. seems like we're always in some sort of conflict. Mm -hmm. And that's when it becomes the war was not meant to be won. It was meant to be continual. And that's, that's what right. George Orwell said. That's right. And so- she bounced from this town hall meeting straight onto the set of the Sean Hannity show. Right. And, and, and Lawrence O'Donnell show. To and be Lawrence O'Donnell show. And you know? she, she yeah. made the rounds because yeah. she's uh, TV attractive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she's just a mom, um, just like yourself, a mom, a mother and a patriot, just like <laughs> yep. yourself. And my parents are, are dear, lovely people. And I don't talk politics with them ever. And I'm just a normal, normal person. This is, by the way, a story we heard over and over and over again from all the tea partiers. And I wrote a long post that I believe had involved Mike Royko jumping up from his grave and cock punching Phil Ponce of Chicago <laughs> 11 television because he sort of credulously interviewed these these Tea Party guys who all swore they had nothing to do with politics. It was never there. I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm just a normal citizen. Turns out they were they were deeply involved in politics. They were deeply involved in conservative right wing politics. Mm -hmm. And Ponce didn't do the basic homework you expect any journalist to do. Uh, he just let him have a microphone. And that's what she was given. Given a microphone, yeah. I'm a normal person, and normal people are freaked out by the Kenyan usurper trying to destroy this trying country. Trying to destroy health care. Yeah. Right. So, Take away her $5,000 deductible health savings mm -hmm. account that she is self-insuring. Right. And her and son hit the, hit the deductible. Yes, he did. And, and, you know, I as I put in my parody video, you know, whoops, your son's insurance is canceled. Right. Because they can just cancel your policy. They can do that. Before the Affordable Before Care Obamacare, Act. Care, they can just, if you hit your deductible too often, they can just cancel your policy. As an auto claims adjuster, she should know that. She should know that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the third time you wrap your car around a tree, you don't get insurance no more. Right. And that was pre-existing conditions, spontaneous cancellations, uh, right. rate increases were all part of having insurance. Right. I right. mean, it was always, it was but always, it was so you know, important for her to keep that choice. Right. I want to keep that choice. Right. Well, it turned out she really didn't want to keep that choice. No, she didn't. Because, because... Uh, she immediately, and I mean immediately, got picked up by Americans for Prosperity. Yes. Koch yes, Brothers no. outfit and given a full time job with them. Yes, she, uh, the, which I'm sure came with insurance for her whole family. This 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 auto claims adjuster from Pennsylvania yeah. became the director of new media for the right wing schlock house Americans for Prosperity. And in case you're unfamiliar, Americans for Prosperity is part of the 501c4 dark money Koch brother group which might be most famous for spending tens of millions of dollars trying to defeat Barack Obama in 2012. What a fucking coincidence. Mm -hmm. uh, they funded the Tea Party. They denied the existence of climate change. They despised unions that try to break them at every opportunity. They opposed the minimum wage. All the usual horrible shit the right does. These are the people mm -hmm. that promote it and pay for it. And she went right to work 
as one of their directors of media. And then she was there for a while and she was promoted to digital marketing coordinator for Americans for Prosperity for three years. And then she was promoted to digital marketing manager for Americans for Prosperity for about a year. This is an auto claims adjuster who's Mm -hmm. now digital manager marketing person for Americans for Prosperity. Pardon my, pardon me. That's all right. And then Um, she spent two years as a regional digital manager for an outfit called In Pursuit Of, which used a lot of buzzwords like embrace change, stakeholders, and optimization. She did that, yes. Then she was the temporary brand manager for Concerned Veterans for America. And the CVA is linked to guess which organization? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the the Koch brothers. brothers. It's the Koch Brothers AstroTurf organization, which lists the same office address as Americans for Prosperity. So she just walked across the hall because mm-hmm. they needed a, a brand manager. And according to SourceWatch, quote, in a post on its website, CVA touted that it has, quote, a seat at the table with the Trump administration. In particular, concerned veterans for America reported that Trump was receptive to their plan to push to privatize Veterans health care. Privatize the VA. So she's yeah. working in a schlock shop. Mm-hmm. Working to push too. the Trump administration to privatize the VA. Now, at this point in our history, uh, Trump and his stooges have completely upended the conservative media and consultant ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Everybody was now tossed into chaos because you had three layer shirt wearing fascist Steve Bannon. And losers and lunatics like Reince Priebus and Corey Lewandowski suddenly at the top of the food chain. And everyone else went scrambling looking for a place in the new order. So where did our girl Katie land? Well, she hooked up with an outfit called the Prosper Group. And I looked them up and their logo looks a whole lot more like DG than PG. So I should probably sue them for something. (laughs) And it describes itself as, quote, helping design data-driven strategies and delivering winning tactics. Uh, As far as we can tell, that means it's a storefront operation that urges Republicans to like and share tweets and digital content. Isn't that exciting? And from there, she has moved on to become a, quote, partner success manager for something called Tatango, which is, quote, a U.S. mobile marketing company that specializes in text message marketing services. And they make the following claim. Tatango is the number one SMS short code provider for political candidates and organizations in the United States with with 10 billion political text messages sent, 50 million American voters reached at a rate of 6 million political texts sent per hour. So wow. Katie Abrams works for a spam shop. Mm-hmm. She works for sh- mm-hmm. all, the, all the garbage you get on your phone. This is one of the companies that just shits this stuff out 24-7 at a rate of... Let me remind you, six million texts per hour. And that's where she has ended up. So while her career seems to have taken a turn towards the spam, that particular conservative media path to success, which is grab a headline any way you can, get yourself mm-hmm. spotlighted on conservative media, and then mm-hmm. parlay that into something bigger is exactly the same today as it was in 2012. In fact, we talked about it on an earlier podcast, didn't we, Blue Gal? Yeah. Yeah, we did. Uh, There was an article in June of this year in ProPublica entitled White Parents Rallied to Chase a Black Educator Out of Town. Then they followed her to the next one. Yeah. And we talked about this on our regular podcast. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the presenters at this parents rally uh, was Rhonda Thomas. She's a frequent guest on conservative podcasts and the founder of the Atlanta-based Truth in Education, a national nonprofit that aims to educate parents and teachers about, quote, radical ideologies being taught in schools. So what is critical race theory? Thomas asked the crowd. It teaches kids that whites are inherently racist and oppressive. No, it doesn't. No. Um, (laughs) Perhaps unconsciously. And that, quote, all whites are responsible for all historical actions and should feel guilty. 
That's not what critical race no. theory is. Rhonda Thomas it. should feel guilty, but no, <laughs> not, that's not what critical race theory, theory teaches. Anyway. She added, I cannot be asked for repentance for something my grandparents did or my ancestors did, right? Nobody's asking No, but you, for you that. can be no. responsible for what you're doing right now. And you can be responsible um, for teaching history in school as it actually happened in this country. Yeah, right, mm -hmm. right. Thomas stressed that parents should form their own nonprofit groups and cut ties with their school's PTAs. The PTA supports everything we're against, she told them. Jeez. Another presenter, a local paralegal named Noelle Cahan, leads the nonprofit Protect Student Health Georgia, which aims to educate on harmful indoctrination, including comprehensive sexuality education and gender ideology. Cahan emphasized how to grab attention during upcoming school board meetings. Identify the best speakers in the group, she told them adding, it's okay to be emotional. Be sure to capture video of them addressing the board or even consider hiring a professional videographer. It's good in case Tucker Carlson wants to put you on air. It really helps, Cahan said. And that's, and that's the key. That's the yeah. clue. So the, this, is the, this is what I've called the lottery, the right-wing lottery. Yes. Which is Fox... And that's Hannity and primetime Fox, Hannity, Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram. Right. We'll put on, and, and they do this frequently enough that it's noticeable, mm -hmm. a plain folks person just like yourself. That's right. Who has stood up to the man, mm -hmm. has declared conservative values, uh, done something in public mm -hmm. uh, to rally for right wing fascism basically you, you know i voted for barack obama i trusted that man <laughs> but he broke my heart you know I voted uh -huh. for bill clinton but he broke my heart yeah you know, i'm a normal and so person now it's trump all the way right now it's trump all the way <laughs> did you vote for him in yes. 2020 hell yeah and you're gonna yes 2024 trump all the way and yeah. it is this parade of sort of camera friendly uh, what the definition of camera friendly has changed now that the proud boys are completely out and everyone's dressing like them but yeah. it's this parade, and there's an endless supply of these people. And the well, reason and you win the lottery. Right. That's right. If you're chosen, mm -hmm. if your outlandish behavior is chosen to be on television, on right wing TV. Mm -hmm. Because as Katie Abrams proved, she has had a seventy five thousand dollar a year job at least, mm -hmm. probably more. For a decade. Ever since. Yeah. Ever since she appeared on television. Mm -hmm. So it and so behaving that way at school board meetings, being outraged, being emotional, mm -hmm. hiring a professional videographer that, to tape you decrying the state of public education when you, you, you don't have any kids in the school district. Right. You're from some other district and you're hiring <laughs> right. a professional videographer to, to film your spontaneous reaction to yeah. this terrible outrage that doesn't exist. It, it and is, that's why these parents that, that ProPublica wrote about when she quit the school district, they went and found her. In another district. And started chasing her out of that one because they were trying to get on Tucker Carlson. Right. That is that is a career path. Right. Literally. Right. That is how, you know, there's, there's several others, I'm sure. I know there are. But one of the things that I have learned from listening to uh, the history of conservative podcasts, Know Your Enemies, and other things like that, mm -hmm. and even even the um, the Bulwark podcast, occasionally yeah. will sort of stray off into, you know, there was this and is, uh, it's different, much different now, this whole feeder system that, mm -hmm. you know, you have people just like player development professionals out there right. scouting for talent. And there's right. a scrum of hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of people all vying for the spotlight all trying to be more outrageous than the next guy, all trying to figure out what Tucker wants to hear. What does he want to say? What is Sean Hannity willing to put on the air? And then doing that thing and then getting their foot in the door. And then there's this right. whole system of, you might have noticed the word nonprofit repeated over and over and over again mm -hmm, in this podcast. Mm -hmm. Those nonprofits have hundreds of millions of dollars being pumped into them, dark money. In, in form of salaries. In form of salaries. To do things to feed the the conservative 
beast. And, yeah. and if, if Katie Abram disappears tomorrow, there'll be five more people lined up for her position. Lined up to do it again. Because, because it's good money. It's it, a good career. It's yeah. a machine and it is a career mm-hmm. path. And the question is, why doesn't the liberal media do this kind of player development out here in middle America, where we're normal Americans just like you, the way conservative media does? And we all know the answer to that. Because there is no liberal media. There just isn't. Yeah, and because because liberals don't want to behave outrageously against education in order to get attention and money. Right. We don't stand on our lawn. We don't want to destroy guns. our schools. Yeah. We don't stand in on our lawn or- pointing guns at protesters and get on right. Tucker Carlson and then run for office based on that. Right. Right. That's not how we do. But the the core problem is that there is a there's staggering amount of money built into the the um, farm system for conservatives Mm -hmm. that goes out and finds people or people are called to their attention or a spotlight catches them or whatever. But it's this thousands of people jumping up and down going, call on me, call on me, call on me. And there are rewards for that. And as the decades have gone by, the amount of outrage, the type of outrage you have to publicly demonstrate has gone up and up and up. The ratchet keeps turning and turning and turning. where you're at, the Capitol building. Right. Kicking breaking in the door. Windows. Kicking in the door, That's breaking it. things in. And yeah. now you're not a terrorist. You're not an insurrectionist. You're a political prisoner who's mm-hmm. driven mm-hmm. to what you did because the dirty, commie, liberal lefties forced you to do it. Mm-hmm. And the reason we're reviewing all of this is to put some context around, as we said, what you're seeing now. This is nothing new. This is This has been the way of things on the right for a very long time. And when we wrote about this, you and I, back 10 years ago, it was clear it was never going to stop. This is how you get ahead in that in that universe. Mm -hmm. And the people Mm -hmm. who should have been paying attention, who should have known better, who should have, you know, stood up and said, this has got to stop or it's going to go right off the cliff and it's going to take all of us with them. Are all the people you now see in the liberal media talking about how shocking it all was, how surprised they were and how nobody saw this coming. Bullshit. Lots of people saw it coming. And that's part of what this new podcast is. It is to contextualize what you're seeing today with a view of history of how things were 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago and how it is that long, long road, very well documented, very well paved, very well marked path from where we were to where we are landed us in this shit pile today. Thank you so much for listening to this practice episode. Yes. Our plan is to do a couple more of these before the end of 2022. And then if we have enough Patreon donors to do these every week on Tuesdays, in addition to our regular Thursday show. Don't forget, we're looking for 300 Patreons to make this podcast fly. So if you can afford to support us in that way, please do so at patreon.com slash proleftpod. And thank you for that. See you next time, guys. The Professional F Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions.